inside my car I got pictures, got candy, I'm a lovable man And I can take you to the nearest star I'm your vehicle, baby I'll take you anywhere you want to go I'm your vehicle, woman By now I'm sure you know That I love you, that I need you need I want to got to have you tried Great God in heaven, you know I love you My first big league contract, 1966, was for $7,000 for the year. You were thankful. And I'm not that old, and I was darn glad I was getting that money. In the 70s, you were paid for performance, and I think after that, you were um, paid on what they thought you could perform, or how they thought you could perform. The guys back in that day, they played baseball because they loved to play the game. The money was incidental. Ballplayers had winter jobs selling used cars or working for roofing companies seemed to make sense. Television has exaggerated everything and you see the money and you see the, the markets change and, uh, and you see games being, you know, uh, satellited around the world. You can, you can watch the Atlanta Braves anywhere in the world because of Turner. If you look back to baseball in the 60s and 70s, I think there was an emerging uh, notion that the players needed to stand up for themselves, that the game needed to modernize, but modernizing did not mean throwing out the tried and true values of the game. And maybe at that time, you got the best combination, you know, of, of what was best about the modern way of looking, things, looking at things, coming together with some sort of respect for the traditions and values of the game. What people didn't understand is that Ball players didn't make much money, and owners did. And ball players have very short careers. You know, a four-year career is a very long career for a professional ball player. Really, when I paid attention to what the game was all about, was when I went in and asked for my very first raise, uh, and you're told the things that you didn't do. We didn't pay Billy, we didn't pay Ernie, and we sure not play, paying you. It had nothing to do with what I did on the field because my stats, I was coming after, after two batting titles, but uh, they wanted to keep the game the same. They had all of the statistics, and all you had was your pride. That was an interesting idea on Finley's part, but when it got to the point that he was looking at free agency for some of the game's biggest players and looking at his rather meager attendance in Oakland and rather meager local television revenues. I think he was making some sort of symbolic protest by saying, look, under these circumstances, I can't afford to pay these guys. I might as well get something for them. They're going to walk on me. You know, so you could, you could view it with disdain that he was the forerunner of the Florida Marlins, or you could say, you know, he, he saw which way the wind was blowing. We're gonna, this is the, it was the only business in the world that if you didn't like what your employer offered, you couldn't go to another business. And we have businesses, we, at that time we had businesses all over the world that if you wanted to terminate your contract, and let's say you work for AT&T and you wanted to go work for some other phone company, you just go in and give you two week notice, say thank you very much, I'm out of here, and you go to work. Baseball, you couldn't do that. And so the, uh, the rules that were governing baseball, all the business rules, okay, were non-existent in baseball. Baseball was free of any rules that they had to abide by that most normal businesses did. And they're still that way, it's, it, which is obviously unconstitutional. And the reserve clause was challenged, and those guys became free agent because they found it. But I'm the one who paved the way, laid my body in the road so you can walk on it today. I stood right up when they tried to push me down. You're so high up, you forget to look down. I was always on the player's side in their early battles with management. I thought that Marvin Miller and Kurt Flood weren't just technically correct or legally correct. I thought they were morally correct. Kurt Flood. No. Kurt Flood was the key. Kurt Flood never got his due because uh, he started to uh, open the doors for free agency. Kurt Flood's in there, too. Um, you know, these guys are responsible, whether these players know it today or not. 
uh, once again, it's a, another history lesson uh, of why they are as fortunate and why they make as much money as they do today. Uh, had to start somewhere. Her flood, you know, here was a guy that was that that probably the average ball player today have you know wouldn't have any idea who he is, and uh, he was a guy that really was the first one to, to really fight the reserve clause and, and uh, really got er other other guys thinking about fighting it and, and uh, really opened up free agency and really opened up the money as far as baseball today as we know it. Someone that challenged the reserve clause and really was the first stepping stone to things changing in the game and, uh, and I think a, a righteous step it, it was. Someone had to make the sacrifices. Someone had to pay a price just so the players coming in today can have what they have right now. He uh, lost his career by fighting for all the ball players, not just the Afro-American ball players, but the ball players as, as, as a whole. Kurt was before his time. He really uh, challenged something that people really weren't aware of and people were a little bit afraid to do it. I think most of the players, their rights not having been firmly established, their union not nearly as powerful uh, as it ultimately would become, were afraid that if they stood shoulder to shoulder with Kurt Flood, they'd suffer consequences. The players are right, and Kurt Flood is a god as far as I'm concerned. All these ball players that are playing now uh, should have gotten, gotten together and given him $10 million because they wouldn't have made the money if it wasn't for Kurt Flood. He sacrificed a lot, and what I told him, I said, I don't think I could. Matter of fact, I know I couldn't have did it. You know, I, and 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 I always tip my hat off, or I always kiss his hand when I see him and say thank you because, uh, you know, what he did was just took a lot of lot of courage. Uh, he was right, but you know, still you can't. Baseball is very traditional sports. Uh, you just can't go in there. And uh, and what he did, uh, I mean, my hat's off to him. I think the tribute to Kurt has not been what it should be. When you look back, baseball, the players in general, oh, Kurt Flood, a mountain of gratitude, a mountain, because he's the first one that set the ball rolling. I think Kurt was the first player to step forward, and, I, and really I think he was at the end of his career, and, and no one knew what was going to happen, and we didn't have uh, any legal precedent on our side, and, and we didn't have the strength in the union that we had years later, and so Kurt was really the maverick who kind of was shaking the, uh, the cell a little bit. Kurt Flood was, no question about it, the pioneer of baseball for the players. He's the one that started everything that's what's transpired today. And you know the sad part, when he died, I don't think a baseball player went to his funeral. You call that gratitude, yeah. You call that gratitude.